I say this a lot, but I always feel like my favourite games are the ones that come out of nowhere and I just pick up on a whim, and today's video is on a game that I saw the other week randomly on Twitter as a gif. This game being Pseudo Regalia. At its core, Pseudo Regalia is the perfect blend of the classic Metroidvania style of level design and game progression mixed with the incredibly open and technical movement and platforming mechanics of high-level 3D Mario speedruns. Made as part of a one-month Metroidvania-themed game jam, which was then later expanded and refined, Pseudo Regalia is a game that does everything it wants to do in a short amount of time with practically zero fat. It has insanely tight controls, but also fundamentally understand what makes for a good Metroidvania character and their level progression, as each new ability not only feels great to use, but is also insanely useful and is more than just a key to unlock new areas with. Each one you acquire makes movement a lot more mechanically deep and interesting, and also makes for new, funner, faster, and more useful ways to traverse even old areas when you're backtracking. To start off, you don't have too much. You have a basic jump, a ledge grab, a backflip, and if you time and move it just right, a slightly higher backflip. Simple Mario 64 stuff, nothing too new. During the tutorial, however, you'll get the slide that allows you to move faster and move under low cover. Pretty simple and obvious stuff still. Still. For me personally, however, it became very clear very quickly how kind of lacking this slide was, and I could feel in my very core just how much this slide needed some sort of a long jump cancel out of it. And luckily the game answered my desires for that very quickly. And after that I was blitzing my way through areas in a very satisfying Ninja Gaiden 1 kind of way, and it felt great. And this is when I hadn't even discovered the super backflip that you could pull off by turning around and jumping again immediately after landing from a long jump. But that wasn't important, what I was doing was still incredibly fun regardless, and it was only the beginning. Since it's from this point onward where every new ability you get is not only something new you can do, but also something else you can blend in and use in tandem with all your other tools. First up, the high jump, or rather the air stomp which will let you perform a high jump after landing it. But what's really neat about the stomp is you can cancel out of it by jumping, allowing for a very small mid-air backflip. It isn't much, but it does still give you some height and a little bit of horizontal movement regardless. What's more, this can be performed on any jump, whether it's a normal, a high, or a long jump. And from here you'll unlock various other abilities, like a wall run, and a limited wall jump, and even a few more that I won't spoil. There's even a bunch of non-essential optional upgrades that you can find by exploring off the beaten path, ranging from simple piece of heart style health upgrades, to stuff like increasing the number of wall kicks that you can do per jump from 3 to 4, or being able to move, albeit very slowly, while healing so you're less vulnerable. All of these main mechanics work really well on their own, but when stacked with each other, you gain absolutely insane amounts of aerial control, providing you have the skill and dexterity to pull them off back to back. What's really great though is that a lot of this stuff that would arguably be the high level Mario 64 speedrun tech feels a lot more intuitive and easy to perform since the game is built with these skills in mind opposed to them being these sort of unintended glitches. It feels a lot less like breaking the game and instead finding those secret areas with all the hidden coins in Mario Odyssey. Because of this, that means there's plenty of opportunities to sequence break, or at the very least take alternate routes to or through various areas and getting different late game power ups a lot earlier than you probably should do. I'm hardly a speedrunner, but in my playthrough I found myself going through the intended path of some areas backwards, and even managed to make my way to a power up through a hole in the ceiling which was meant to be a shortcut back down after getting it essentially skipping this entire small gauntlet of enemies and obstacles. It's a speedrunner's dream, with the average first playthrough probably clocking in somewhere around 4-6 to six hours, but if you look at the any and 100% speedruns, the two of them only last 12 and 35 minutes respectfully. Which does just go to show that while it does have the more casual, intended path through the game, if you can crack it open, you can absolutely go wild. There are, however, a couple of abilities like the Tompa's Heavy Attack that you can use to break one-way barriers that 
do kind of feel like they're just keys to unlock gated progress, with the other one being a projectile to hit switches from a distance. But the use of these are pretty few and far between, so they didn't bother me too much, especially since they're usually for optional upgrades or have alternate solutions to getting past the obstacles that they would normally just remove. One aspect that I wasn't super fond of, especially when I was first playing, was simply by just how easy it was to get lost. The game has no map, which in some ways I did kind of like, since it meant that you had to rely on your own navigation and orienteering skills, but I do think some sort of signposting would be pretty useful for the game. Whether that be literal signposts, giving you some sort of clue of where you are compared to other areas of the castle, or maybe some sort of a limited map system, like having several you are here boards scattered around the castle. The other gripe I had with the game is that the combat is very lacklustre. Partially by design though. Based off the impression of the Steam page, the combat is deliberately pretty light as to not let it bog down the main meat and potatoes of the game being the platforming, but it does kind of feel underwhelming as a result. Especially when the main way of dealing with pretty much every enemy encounter is just running and jumping in circles around the enemy and mashing the attack button. The thing is, there is some pretty neat ideas here, like the indignation bar, which is a sort of momentum meter. As you hit enemies, it fills up, and it will grant you with things like more range and more damage as you fill each pip. And the only way of healing outside of save points is by spending some of this bar and losing the buffs that it gives you. It's a really cool idea, but with nothing else going on, it doesn't really amount to all that much. There are two bosses, one being in the tutorial, which is a tankier version of one of the normal enemies that you encounter in the game with a few extra unique attacks, with the other being the final boss at the end of the game, which is admittedly pretty fun. It teleports around and does a few interesting things, and you have to use your different movement abilities to avoid various attacks and chase it down. And it's this boss that makes me feel like they really could have leaned in on this a little bit more, and made some interesting boss boss encounters that revolve around your different movement techniques. Like waiting for the boss to tire themselves out while they throw projectiles that are either high or low that you have to slide or high jump over or under. Or having a boss where you have to climb up various platforms in different ways to get to a weak point as they throw things at you. With that all being said, I do suppose the original scope of the game does make what I'm saying a little bit unreasonable. The combat isn't the only thing that's simple about pseudo regalia, the visuals are pretty simple as well, however what I will say is that there's a bunch of little touches that really do a lot to make it memorable. It's obvious that it's going for this low poly PS1 slash N64 look and it does it really well, even if it does go a little bit too hard in some areas with them looking a little bit grey boxy. Though actually, thinking about it, it isn't necessarily that inaccurate of how some games looked back then. But either way, for the most part, each area does look pretty easily distinguishable, and I think that's the most important part. My personal favourite areas were the Twilight Theatre for its amazing background music, and the library, because it's a little bit more detailed and interesting looking compared to a lot of the other places I felt. But one place that I think is particularly standout was the Underbelly. Personally for me, it was my least favourite area because I came here a little bit early and found it very tricky to navigate and also it's just very dark looking. But I love that this place is filled with the bad parts of these old consoles, being the N64 fog and the PS1 polygon wobbling. It feels kind of like this sort of meta joke about how all of the bad things of these consoles exist in this one hellish area. And speaking of retro visuals, there's actually these really the options in the menu that I really appreciated. The first being a retro resolution filter that does your typical lower res thing along with some light CRT filter etc, but it does go the extra mile with stuff like divering and really close texture mip mapping that really helps sell the effect even more. It also actually lowers your resolution which makes it a lot easier to run on your PC if it's especially potato like or if you just really want to hit those high 60 plus frame rates. And speaking of frame rates, this is where we get to the other option, the really weird retro frame rate setting. 
where whilst the game can go all the way up to 144 frames per second and it will run accordingly with the camera and character models sliding around at that frame rate, this retro frame rate option essentially culls all of the 3D models' animations specifically to something like 10 or 15 FPS. And this works in a very similar fashion to stuff like the newer Arxis games like Guilty Gear Strive, Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, and Dragon Ball Fighters, or like the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse movie. What's weird is that this frame rate culling is, as far as I know, not really a retro game thing outside of games just running like shit sometimes back then. So if I'm perfectly honest, I don't really know why it's a thing, but either way, it does make the game a little bit more visually interesting and unique to look at, so I did keep it on pretty much for the entirety of my playthrough. The other option that I got a very good chuckle out of was the one option that you can find in the accessibility section. Now, you may not have noticed, but Pseudo Regalia's protagonist is a furry, and a weird bunny cat goat thing at that. And Sybil here has definitely got a very lovingly modelled character design to say the least. Luckily the devs realised that this may be a little bit off-putting for certain normal folk out there, we'll call them normies for short, and just for them they included a coward button that allows you to put a big old pair of baggy trousers on Sybil if you'd so please. Although, if you don't, the game actually does a really cool thing that I love in gaming, where upon obtaining certain upgrades it will reflect in the character model, meaning that Sybil visually gets more strong looking throughout the game as you play. But yeah, that's just about it. If you're a fan of 3D platformers or the Egovania games, then you should definitely play Pseudo Regalia. It's a ton of fun, it's dirt cheap, it's pretty low commitment so it won't distract you from all of the tons of other games that are coming out right now. But it's still also fairly meaty even if you only go for it once. And did I also mention it's fun? So yeah, go play it. Hey everyone. How you doing? It's good to be back. I think we technically went about four months only uploading one thing during that period for a minute there. I got hit by some pretty nasty burnout for a while, followed by getting COVID and also rearranging a lot of stuff in my room to make way for my new desk and PC. So all in all, I kind of had to just keep putting off videos for a while there. Still got a little bit of the after effects of COVID making me feel kind of tired all the time, but I'm very much reinvigorated and wanting to make a lot of videos again. I've got quite a lot of new ideas for videos that I want to do, some being different styles than just my typical reviews that I've been doing. And I've now got a dual monitor set up, so doing things like streaming over at Twitch won't be an absolute pain in the ass anymore. The old setup was putting my old dying laptop on my bed and just having that as a second screen, but I have to turn my head like 90 degrees every time I wanted to read chat. And it it was not very useful. So yeah, streaming is something I want to do semi-regularly from now on. So if uh, you want to go follow me over on the Twitch, I certainly won't complain. In fact, most of the footage in this video is from the streams of Pseudo Regalia. I kind of just wanted to stream it to get back into the groove of things, but decided, yeah, I do kind of want to make a video on this, even if it's not a full scripted effort thing. I did this in a very similar way to those demo quick looks that I did in the E3 period last year where instead of a proper script I just had a collection of notes and some shorthand sentences and kind of just did my best. And I do think I kind of want to make a bit of a habit of doing these things, especially if I stream something that's particularly interesting but it's some sort of sleeper indie hit or something that I think that came out a while ago and has kind of just been forgotten. And doing them in this style makes them really quick to make, so I can kind of squeeze them in between the actual scripted footage. I mean, it only takes about, I don't know, two or three days to get all of this all together. I don't know if you, the viewer right now, noticed if it was a little jarring or didn't flow quite as well as some of my videos or not, but if you did, please let me know. I'll try and improve it a bit. Personally, I think the intro might have been a little bit too fast-paced and I got into things a bit too quickly, but I'll work on it. But yeah, in the near future, look forward to another one of these, as well as a remake of an old video, I guess? Or like a re-review, since the new officially localized version of it will be coming out soon. And after that, I've got a few video essay things that I want to do. Like, very strictly video essay stuff, but either way, I'll 
stop the video here now. I've rambled on enough for this little end bit. But yeah, as always, thanks for watching and see ya.